So you mentioned that you'd visited Climax and Henderson on that trip in, in the USA. So I guess that would, would that have been the first time you saw unidirectional certification textures? Most U definitely. USTs? Yeah, yeah, most definitely. And it was very much an AMAX thing. Um, the research that people like Ennis Garrity and Jim Shannon had done on Climax and Henderson was brilliant. Um, they'd figured out what these USTs meant. Um, at the time, it was felt that they were um, direct indicators for Climax type molly deposits, which in fact they are, but later of course it turns out that they're, they're not uh, specific. But anyway, yes, they ran a short course and at some point in time most of the geologists working for AMAX um, had the opportunity to visit Climax and Henderson and, and be exposed to these kind of textures. Um, I was very fortunate, it was um, a few years before that I was able to do that and uh, on that basis, um, a lot of deposits around the world, uh, particularly in, um, in Mexico and uh, other parts of the US, were picked up simply on the basis of having USTs. Unfortunately for AMAX, um, not long after that, um, a new CEO took over, um, a French gentleman, and he really didn't have any appreciation for exploration or the business, and he started to acquire molybdenum deposits um, globally at great cost, not realizing that um, there was so much potential byproduct from the South American porphyries, and uh, this led finally to um, uh, the collapse of AMAX, which was a great shame. But at that time, um, they had a cutting edge uh, advantage by um, recognizing these kind of textures. So um, I had that experience, um, and then when I was doing my master's at James Cook, uh, I became very good friends with Max Baker. Uh, Max and I both love looking at rocks and discussing geologic problems over a couple of beers. Max was doing his PhD on Kidston. So uh, I said to him, Max, I'd like to come up for a few days while you're mapping, which I did. And so uh, Max said, oh, there's a place I want to show you. And uh, we went up the side of Wiser's Hill and there was a, a boulder about this size and it was a clast and it was totally USTs. The whole thing was just USTs. And it was a class in what? In the, in the Kidston Breccia pipe. Uh -huh. Yeah. So uh, I just about fell over and uh, Max and I discussed this and I said, I think this is probably the first recognition of a UST, not only uh, in a system that's not a climax type, but in an intrusion related gold deposit. I was going to say, we're talking about gold here. Yes, yeah. yeah. And, and that was just, for us, that was a tremendous revelation. So I excitedly went back to uh, AMAX's office and I said, John, this is John Hammond, who was um, in charge of AMAX in uh, Eastern Australia. John had also been in charge where I was working in Namosi, so very close friend. And I said, John, we've seen USTs in a gold deposit. We've got to get out there and look where, where all the others are. And uh, John too was very excited. And so over a period of the next year, we were scouring North Queensland for USTs, and we found them in quite a lot of places actually, somewhere in, in tungsten deposits. Um, they emerged at Red Dome, uh, not long after what Max and I had seen at Kidston. Then they emerged at Mount Lation, um, and then finally in, in places like um, Ridgeway, uh, North Parks, and it turned out that they were relatively common. However, uh, of course, very significant from an exploration perspective. Because it tells you something about the magmatic hydrothermal two, two, two process. Two things, yeah. James. One is that um, you're in, a, in a, um, an intrusive complex area that has overpressured volatiles and fluids, i.e. capable of forming ore deposits. And it also tells you something about levels of erosion. Because if you're seeing them in the outcrop, well, you're possibly too deep. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it's... Um, and, and all of the geologists that I've had in my exploration teams um, have been well aware of these since day one and they've turned up in uh, many places, specifically Mongolia. Uh, we found them at Oyu Tolgoi, um, we found them at Hamogtai, um, all over Mongolia they were quite common, tungsten systems. Mm. But what I did find out later, which um, greatly impressed me, was um, Rima Seltman, who's a close friend of mine. Uh, we, we used to often discuss them, as uh, did Rod Kirkham uh, and others. But uh, Reimer told me that he knew of a publication by a Russian woman 
whose name was Pavolitis, and she wrote a wonderful report on those textures from um, southern Siberia in the late 60s. She had great photographs, but she really didn't appreciate their economic significance. But and what were the rocks? Oh, um, tungsten systems. Tungsten. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I, I would credit her probably with the first person to to recognise those sort of things as as a magmatic to hydrothermal transition. But um, putting them in an economic context came later. Right. With um, from the climax. Like, with the climax and later Rod Kirkham, um, Dave Sinclair, uh, all UST aficionados. Well, I told you a, a year or two ago, didn't I, that I, I mapped some in, in a, a, a PGE deposit in Ontario. Yes, In a yes. Gabbro, for crying yeah, out loud. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, yeah. there's, it, it, um, there's no reason why that couldn't happen. Mm. Yeah. yeah they, um, also, I, as part of my master's thesis, um, I photographed a rock that was on display at the Natural History Museum, and it was a quartz tourmaline UST. It was only quartz and the intra quartz area was black tourmaline. And, and um, I photographed this and I, I realized it was, it was part of the, the story of the, of the smoking gun for the formation of tourmaline pipes. And uh, it was in the frontispiece of my thesis. And I went back to the Natural History Museum many times uh, in the subsequent years, for at least 10 years, and nobody could ever find it. I wanted to to try and study it more or get a piece of it for the UST collection. Anyway, uh, cut a long story short, I was with Reimer in the Natural History Museum uh, in September last year and we were looking through some of the dusted cabinets and there was a, a very large room that, that had cabinets and dust and rocks everywhere and we're walking past and something caught my eye and in this cabinet towards the back there was the specimen and it was from the Dorothy mine just adjacent to the Wheel Jane tourmaline pipe. I said, Reimer, there it is. So we took it out, uh, I re-photographed it, and now I'm hoping to convince the curators to take a slab off it for the UST collection that's now housed in the ROM. Will they do it? I, I'm hoping so. I've explained to them it's not for me. I've got Reimer backing me, so but you never know. Maybe you need to talk to Richard Harrington. Well, yes, uh, Richard. Uh, Richard's been CC'd on the correspondence. And I hope Richard's here at the PDAC, actually. All right, well, I'll, uh, I'll lean on him if I see him. Yeah, we'll, we'll mount a pressure movement. Yeah.